Podcast fam, Alexandra DeRose is a high school senior at the Professional Children's School in New York City, and she trains at the School of American Ballet in New York City as well. She developed Peace Love Leotards when she was eight years old and incorporated the idea into a nonprofit organization just last year. The goal of Peace Love Leotards is to bridge the socioeconomic gap in the performing arts by providing dancewear to underprivileged dancers. Since its inception, the organization has reached dancers all over the country and the world. Enjoy today's show. You are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. <laughs> Sang it. Whoa. I was, I was going to see if you are going to harmonize with me that time. I mean, I never you know. know. I, I never know, know what you're going to do. Know. What's going on, man? How are you? Uh, I'm well, so it feels like I haven't been here in a while. I know. What's, I'm up, here, with, what's up with that? Yeah, I'm here to tell you that the the common cold still does exist, and you don't actually have to go get tested for it. It turns out, uh, you kind of feel silly when you do, but no, really, I mean, you should, I guess, if you're exhibiting any symptoms of anything, you you got to go through the motions, get tested, and everything. And I've yeah. been tested, poked, and prodded, and I keep getting told I don't have COVID, which is good. But uh, I'm feeling better, and here I am, and I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad to be back. All the precautions, right? Until no, we, we did. know we, for sure. We, we disinfected it. Now I mean, yeah. like it's. I'm it's glad crazy. that it wasn't COVID, though. Yeah. No, me too. Um, but it is just kind of a reminder that like you can just basically get your old garden variety sickness still that still exists out there. So not yeah. everything is COVID. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh. It's right humbling. on, man. Yeah, Let's but get I'm into good. The show. Yeah. Excited for it. Uh, so we do have some sponsors to thank. Um, yeah. You know, there are a handful of companies in Gainesville that are just trusted hometown favorites. One of those is Crime Prevention Security Systems, or CPSS, as you see all over the yard signs all around town. This family-owned and operated security company was started back in 1975. Today, are the local leader in securing families, homes, and businesses. And this is real security, all professionally installed and monitored, which is what you want when it comes uh, when it comes to protecting those you love. The CPSS team are crazy passionate about what they do. It shows in their quality of their work and it explains how they've earned the trust of thousands of your friends and neighbors that they proudly serve. And you can visit them online at cpss.net forward slash WHOA. 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 That's not not CPSS (laughs) forward slash WHOA. Whoa. It's just slash whoa. Right. And you guys, we all know that due to the impact of COVID-19, COVID-20, COVID-21, and maybe (laughs) COVID-22, that deeply cleaned and highly sanitized businesses are the new norm. You know your customers are going to want to walk into a business they know is safe. Make sure you call the best, the best restoration, and let them help you and your keep let them help you keep your business top notch. These guys can handle it all. Let me just list some of the services real quick so you have a full idea of their capabilities. These guys do water extraction and restoration, mold remediation, which they've done here for us in the Big past. Time. Area rug cleaning, area duct cleaning, carpet cleaning, tile and grout cleaning, carpet repairs. They have carpet protectant services, upholstery cleaning services, fire damage restoration, and so much more. Be sure to give our friends at the best restoration a shout at 352-505-3321 or visit them at thebestrestoration.com. Right. I love those guys. Love CPSS. Couldn't do this without them. So thank you guys for your support and please support our sponsors. Yes. And do, 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 do. wait, you guys, this just in. I'm not kidding. Sarah literally typed this out right before the show and handed it to me. <laughs> Podcast fam, our very own Sarah Lentz, who wouldn't want to be on, she didn't want to be on camera. I was like, just come on and tell the whole podcast family early. And she's like, no, you know, it's fine. Our very own Sarah Lentz is putting on a scavenger hunt with her team from Fishing for Vision and the Florida Kids Sight Foundation. Come celebrate the senior class of 2021 by participating in a scavenger hunt around Gainesville. Grab your family, friends, and of course your graduating senior to have all eyes on deck to embark on the hunt. Prizes will prizes up will be prizes will be awarded. She messed up the script. With the winning team earning two hundred fifty dollars. Register register today at Facebook.com GNB Scavenger Hunt. Again, that's Facebook.com GNB Scavenger Hunt. In all seriousness, this young lady works extremely hard. This is benefiting a great cause. So go please support her and uh, and the team over at Fishing for Vision. I was so afraid I was gonna miss this, like this little, what do they call it, is that alliteration? 
Yeah. The, yeah. Fishing, yeah. Fishing for vision. So, me and you're going to go do this? I've never lost a scavenger hunt. Yeah? No, never. Never? Yeah. yeah, especially if it's Gainesville. But yeah. No, you, well, this might be the first time, my friend. Oh, are we going to do it together, though? Oh, we're going to. Oh, that's, that's what team. I'm saying. We'll just, I don't yeah. split the 250 with you. Is this like a single participant or is this like in teams? Teams. Team, yeah. So, we got to split it? We'll, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just put it in the podcast. <laughs> we'll just put it in the podcast. Okay, okay, all right. Well, good Selfi- luck with that, you Sarah. selfish mofo. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, thanks for all you do. That's so, that's so awesome. So, now, are there any more breaking news stories, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you guys, today on the show, we have Alexandra DeRose. Did yeah. I say it right? Close, you're, you're yeah. Close. Dang, dang it, you guys! I try so hard. It's, it's like super easy if you just like just say it. Just say it. All right, you say it. DeRose. DeRose. That's that's close. Alexandra DeRose, Miss Gainesville's Outstanding Teen and founder and president of the nonprofit organization Peace Love Leotards Incorporated. Alexandra, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I told her, literally, guys, I told her I'm like, I'm going to mess this up because for some reason I have an issue with names. <laughs> and I practiced it like three or four times, but still, I don't know what it is. That's okay. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. I'm excited um, to be here. Yeah, we, we lo- we'd love to jump into just your story and then let this whole thing unfold from there so why don't you take us back and uh, just you know fill fill in our audience about your your story here okay so I'm a dancer and I've been dancing since the age of two and a half but a lot of people's story is like oh I saw the Nutcracker and while that's great mine is very different Um, I was actually when I was born the doctors told my parents I was born with hip dysplasia and weak ankles and high arches in my feet so they were concerned about my walking capabilities and I had a Russian podiatrist who knew about dancers who had had similar problems. Um, and so she said, um, why don't you put Alex in ballet? That would help strengthen her um, hips, legs, and feet. And my parents were like, okay. So they called every studio in our area that would take a two and a half year old. And they finally found one and that's how I started dancing. And I just fell in love with it ever since. Um, So I guess, fast forward, um, I've been dancing a while, I do all different styles, and then I started to focus on ballet really seriously when I was 11, and I continued on that track, and then when I was 14 years old, I attended a summer intensive at the School of American Ballet, and they asked me to stay for their winter term program, which meant that I would be moving to New York by myself at 14 into a dormitory, like a college student, but four years earlier. And so I was super excited for this opportunity, but you know, it meant moving away and um, it was just super amazing. So actually a little bit before that at eight, I wanted to, this is how Peace Love Leotards comes in. So I'd been a dancer for a while and at eight years old, I was a part of something called the Miss Florida Sunshine Princess program. And that is, so I'm Miss Gainesville's Outstanding Team 2020, and I have a Sunshine Princess right now, and that's our mentor program, our mentee program. And so um, I had wonderful mentors in my community who had their own social impact initiatives, which is where they do service work in their community and advocate for something that they're extremely passionate about. And so I asked my mom at eight, you know, what, what is a social impact initiative? And she told me, and so I was, and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna find something that I'm passionate about, and that was dance. Um, and so I was like, well, how can I do something to give back to the community that gave so much to me? And that was really, I came up with the idea of collecting dancewear, which you might not think like, oh, collecting dancewear and distributing it back out. Well, dancewear is extremely expensive. To participate in the art form of dance, like the average cost per dancer is at least $100 just for a pair of tights, a leotard, and ballet flats. And then point shoes, once you get into the upper like levels, which is what I was doing when I went to the School of American Ballet, um, point shoes are around $100 a piece. So it's, ext- and I go through right now two pairs a week. Mm. So it's extremely expensive. And so when I was eight, I was like, okay, like people at my studio, they've told me like, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to come back for the next dance season because on top of all of that, there's the fees for the classes, there's the entry fees for competitions, there's fees for all of this. So 
I'm 5'11", I'm really tall, and we were growing out of all of our dancewear at the time, and it was still in great condition. So I decided to put a little collection box at my studio, collect the dancewear, and then redistribute it to the people who needed it. And that's kind of how Peace Love Leotards was born. And then I continued You started dance- doing that as young as eight? Yep. Okay. So. Uh, how old are you now? 17. Okay. Senior in high school. So then I just continued on the dance journey, went to SAB, And then this past year, I had been wanting to compete in the same program that gave me the idea to to start Peace Love Leotards, so the Miss Florida organization. And I wanted to compete and win a title, an outstanding teen title, and compete at the Miss Florida competition, which would have been in June 2020, and now it's in June 2021. Um, And so it worked out with my schedule. I was a senior in high school, so it was my last year of eligibility. And, or a junior in high school then, I guess. And I decided to compete and I won the title of Miss Gainesville's Outstanding Teen in 2020. And a few months later, I was like, okay, well, it's time to even up what I had been doing with Peace Love Leotards from when I was eight. And I officially incorporated the organization into a nonprofit and we gained our 501c3 tax exempt status, which was really exciting almost a year ago. And since then, I've just been running the organization and so much has happened. So what goes into consideration for Outstanding Teen 2020? Okay, so at, there's multiple facets of the um, competition. It's interview, so we have an interview, kind of like what I'm doing right now. And um, then there is fitness, um, there is talent, and there is evening gown and on stage question. So. Those are the four main areas, and um, yeah, it's talent, so I get to showcase what I do and what I love. Okay, and how many people are in that uh, right. consideration or in that? Um, in competing yep. in 2021, there's 21 outstanding teens competing for Miss Florida's Outstanding Team. Okay, so I mean, I'm soaking in all the story. I'm writing like little bullet points down as I go, right? So I have to think, and I'll apologize to our audience if I'm a little all over the place, <laughs> but I have to think that moving to New York City mm-hmm. at 14 years old mm-hmm. is like crazy. <laughs> like from from a standpoint of like, oh my gosh, like this is such a huge monumental thing, right? Yeah. And you went by yourself. So they essentially our um, parents go up with us and move us into the dorms and we live there with I believe it's 64 other ballet students and then there's an on-site uh, it's a residence hall so it's on site with um, they have we have people that you know um, look after us take care of us they're the, the residence hall staff and we're in the same building as the Juilliard dormitories so it's kind of in that area in New York but yeah essentially and then our parents like go back to our home and we stay there and train so what did your parents think of all this I mean were they kind of used to this lifestyle since you had already been in a you know been a dancer since you were so young uh, or were they were very like uh <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself as a as a parent I'm probably like uh my kid in New York City go, at yeah. four, you know at 14 years old like I don't know but so yeah my my parents would probably tell you that they 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 would tell you that they they didn't want me to leave home obviously but my parents are the most supportive people so they were like like if this is your dream you have to go for it and um, so it was kind of a mix of those two things, but um, I guess you could say they kind of saw it coming in a sense because the ballet track is very like fast tracked at a very young age. So mm-hmm. I started, I was at my local competition studio until age 11, and then I started training at Next Generation Ballet in Tampa, Florida, and I did that from throughout my middle school years. And over the summer, they encourage us to go to these summer intensives that are um, at different schools across the country. And so um, the School of American Ballet is the school affiliated with the New York City Ballet, um, which is like the premier like dance company in the United States, which I can't even believe that I get to train there. Um, so I wanted to audition for their summer program. I was 12 the first time and they took me in and I got a merit scholarship to train there for the summer. So I went there for the summer and then it's well known that when you're 14, 
you are old enough to be asked to invited to stay year round. And I told my parents I loved it so much, that's what I wanted to do. I loved training there. And so they knew that I was what I wanted to do. But So you, you were know. like planting that seed and preparing them a little early. So the co- Just in case I <laughs> yeah. get asked, mom, dad, this is really what I would like to do. So then the next summer, same situation, they um, I was accepted into the summer intensive on a merit scholarship, and you. the second day I was there, I, the first day is our placement class for the level that we're gonna be training in over the summer. And the second day I was there, um, one of my valet teachers now, she walked up to me and she was like, you're Alexandra, right? And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she was like, how would you like to train here year round? I was like, I would, Love that. And then we didn't hear anything else for oh, a few no. weeks. What a tease. I know, what's up? <laughs> and then my parents, they got a call saying, or they got a email setting up a call and they got a call and it said like, we'd like to invite your daughter to train here year round. And how, how long, like how much time lapsed? You said you didn't hear anything first and then. Two, like two, three weeks. Okay, so you're like sweating it for you. Why did they ask this? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, are they gonna ask me to stay? Like maybe, I don't know. I was like, this is a good sign, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And I just remember that day, they, my dad kept calling me on the phone and he was like, answer your phone like a FaceTime. And I was like, I'm on the fifth floor, which is like the level that we, um, the floor that we train at in the, high rise building. And um, I was like, I can't, like I'm on the fifth floor, people are around, like can this wait just till I get up into my room? And he was like, no, 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 I need you to answer the phone. I was like, hold on dad, I gotta get back up to my room. So I went up there and I opened the FaceTime call and my family's holding a sign that said congratulations. Mm-hmm. And I had gotten to, nice. to say. Yeah, <laughs> so I guess it's, they. I mean they had kind of been prepared for it, but it was just, whether it would actually happen or not. Did you ever have any doubts about whether that's what you wanted to do? I mean, even like going into New York, were you ever like, oh my gosh, this is like concrete jungle, this is cute. Did you get homesick? Were you ever having any doubts at all? Well, I knew that I wanted, like at 11, I knew that I wanted to dance in a professional ballet company. So I knew that I wanted to do that. And then when I figured out that it was like the New York City Ballet and the School of American Ballet, I didn't have any doubts about going. I wanted to go so bad. And then when I was there, it. I love New York. It's like one of, it's one of my favorite places in the country. Florida is always home. I love the state of Florida. So Florida and New York, my favorite places. But it's just a completely different atmosphere. But I think because I had had, I mean, the experience of staying there for five weeks during the summer, for the past two years, I was a little bit used to the city. But I wasn't used to the fact that you know summer it's all fun. No, no. Besides like putting in the work to dance. You're not worried about schoolwork. You know, you're just like kind of exploring and like going out on these like field trips with the staff. And um, so when I got there, I was like, wow, okay, this is this is different. But I knew that I wanted to do it. I didn't have It's gotta be extremely competitive, right? To have have that kind of spot. Yeah. (laughs) So did you ever have any like, like I've obviously never seen you dance, but like did you ever have any worries about like, you know, am I good enough or anything like that? I love these questions. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea. I mean, like basically, and even now we don't really get too much feedback on like how we're doing. Occasionally we get and we get what we get in class, but we don't have meetings too often with our teachers that tell us like how we're doing. So even now there's always like the question like, oh, how am I doing? Am I good enough to, you know, now it's the question is, am I going to be good enough to get into the company? Mm. But, um, Yeah, back then, of course, I mean, the, let me see. So I'm gonna give you some numbers. Approximately every year, there's probably over 2,000 students that audition for the School of American Ballet summer course. And then they pick 200 to go. And then out of that, they pick 20 to stay. So they narrow it down quite a bit. And then when we're there, we have, right now I have like a little over 20 girls in my class. And from there, boys and girls, they may take like two or three or none into the company. It really just depends on the year. So there's always been the question like, will I be good enough for the next step? But you just gotta keep pushing because if you let that affect your mindset, you're not gonna get anywhere. So talk to me a little bit about this new balance between dancing and being a businesswoman. Oh my gosh. Well, because this, <laughs> this new, this, I mean, you actually set up the nonprofit last year. 
mm-hmm. in 2020. So mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is new. I I've been running a business a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I know it takes a lot of work. <laughs> so I'm very interested to kind of see how you're balancing these these two aspects of your life now. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. So there's, it's not really like I don't consider it work because it's something that I look forward to and I enjoy. And um, I've been balancing school and dance pretty much since the time I could walk. And then when I got into, when I was 11 and started training in ballet seriously, I started balancing academics because I took advanced classes at my school and I was um, training pre-professionally there. So, I mean, that was, I would go to school from eight to 12 something every day. And then I would go there and train for the rest of the day and do my homework till like 2 a.m. and then go back and do it all again the next day. So essentially I've had kind of that sort of like balance my whole life but adding this different element on top of it, to me, it's just like another another aspect. Um, it's crazy. I mean, we've done so much already. I mean, it's a global organization now, which I'm really proud to say. Um, so far, we have we've created an ambassador program so that students, dance students, or even if they're not dance students, but they really just want to help the arts, can collect dancewear in their communities. So we have an, a global ambassador program, which is filled with about 20 ambassadors and it stretches to Singapore. And um, they collect dancewear in their community. We've been featured in these these magazines, Point Magazine and Dance Spirit Magazine, which are two of the largest dance magazines in the whole, in the world. And so, and I've read them since I was little. So that was truly incredible. Um, we've gained 11 dancewear sponsors. So dancewear brands that are very well known will just essentially give us dancewear to give out. Um, so that's another way. Um, corporate sponsor to corporate donors, we have those as well. And we've been able to collect over $11,000 in donations so far. So it's very busy in that aspect. And then, um, you know, but it's really fun. I wouldn't- Are people are sending all of this dancewear like to you? How's it, how's it being collected and where is it going? Or is it staying within their own communities to? No, it's going to me. It's, com- it's coming to <laughs> it's you? It's coming to me, yeah. So is this like all in your garage or something? Or, yes. Yes, just in boxes, like it. sorted out by size and in my house. <laughs> hey man, it's you, a true You sound startup. like it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> It's, I wouldn't. Or just like with the amount of stuff or something. When I see the amount of stuff piled up, I'm like, whoa, this is a, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of stuff, but I, I'm i like not overwhelmed by the amount of work, maybe just overwhelmed by the visualness right. in front of me. Um, so yeah. <laughs> It's like true startup life, right? right? Selling t-shirts out of the back it's of your a, car, yeah, selling dancewear out of your garage. The, it's in the garage. So I mean, are you, are these donations then being donated or are they just being offered at like a less expensive price? Or, oh no, they're know, being 100% donated. donated. Yeah, Did they. Um, we have a, on our website we have an um, application for dancewear page so anyone who wants to apply for dancewear will basically tell us like, like the dance studio they dance with, like kind of like what their situation is, like um, where they're from, um, what sizes they would need and so from there, then we just kind of fill their order. Um, and then another thing that we do. And is that what the extra money, like, so if you get donations for you know the $11,000, like is that going towards the actual shipping costs of it? Like how yeah. are you guys managing so, that aspect? Like part of the $11,000 in donations has been in kind, which is like dancewear from the dancewear sponsors Got or it. like the people that just like collect their old dancewear and send it in. But part of it comes from either corporate donors or just, you know, everyday people who want to give back and that goes to, so essentially if we don't have in our inventory what a person is needing, then we also have a sponsor that is located near the studio that I used to dance at, their store is Dance Tampa, and they will, I will buy items from them at like a discounted price. So that's like my awesome. deal with them um, in terms of you know getting more dancewear and being able to send it out. So, and then there's, um, this organization that we work with called Ballet and Books, and they are um, an organization that promotes dance and literacy for children. And so they, for their dance classes, they need dancewear for their students um, because a lot of them are like 
socioeconomically challenged. And so they will tell me like the sizes and everything and we'll send it through that program. So there's a lot of different ways that we're able to help the people in our community, but it just depends on like what the program is, if it's an individual person, like how they wanna go about it. But essentially you contact me, we can, we can work something out for you. Are there other organizations that do what you do? Yes, but not many. And we kind of approach it, I think, in a little bit of a different way, especially with some of the projects that we're beginning to work on. Um, so a lot of what I've been working on is not only just, you know, collecting dancewear and distributing it back out, but I've been doing like a lot of research and learning about like why why the arts are important because I've obviously believed that they're important my whole life. I've participated in them and I've learned hard work and determination and organizational skills and basically I'm the person I am today because of the arts, but I've done statistically, you know, an average, a person who participates in the arts is four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement. And so I've learned about multiple statistics like that. Um, and what we're starting to do is I'm going to build, and I'm in the process of doing it right now, a dance curriculum that can be implemented for anyone who wants it or implemented within schools because within schools, the first thing that gets cut from budget cuts is mm -hmm. arts programs. Mm -hmm. And so I want to go about making sure that everyone has access to an arts education by like directly targeting schools as well. So That's great. What is the what is the demand like in terms of like the solici solicitations you get for from people that are interested in getting dancewear and stuff like that? Are you able to meet that demand or mm -hmm. do you have more than than what you can put up with right now? Um no, it's pretty like um, it's pretty like even, I would say. Like it's very easy. Like someone will, I, f I feel like I f always find a way. Like even if we are like, let's say we they need something that's not in our inventory, um, I always find a way to like I'll start like posting on Facebook or something like fundraiser for this cause, like blah 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 specifically, and then we'll usually get donations that way. So I feel like I always try to find a way to meet someone's need because I think that's important. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a call in question here. I, I'm interested in the fact that you said Facebook because what what I've learned on this podcast is that social media platforms can be very um, age age specific. And you said you're 17. So what what about Facebook is the best platform for for you to get that information out there? Do you, are you on the other platforms? Are they equally um, like conducive to, to getting your message out there and getting people to to sign up for that? Or I think it depends on the audience you're trying to reach. I'm on mostly all platforms because I want to reach. Uh, multitude of different audiences. So you don't I, feel like only old people are on Facebook? She I totally mean, does. <laughs> she totally I does. Mean, I mean, a lot of people- If hypothetically we were both twice your age, you wouldn't think that we were just old because we were on Facebook. <laughs> no, but like I do know that more people like um, my mom's age and older are on Facebook. So like, you know- that it Makes it less cool. No, it's just another <laughs> social easier to get money from those people. No, it's just another social media platform that, that targets a different, I'd say a different audience right. because now, I mean, there's Instagram, which are for people probably like my age and even a little bit older than me, and now there's TikTok. Right. So like there's, there's just, it depends on what target audience you're trying to reach. And something about Facebook that I say like ask for donations is they have the specific like nonprofit donation button that you can mm -hmm. go that's through. True. So that's something that I really like about Facebook. That's a very um, great feature. Right. Yeah. So that's that's why I said I mentioned Facebook. But yeah. are you have you set up like the uh the Amazon thing to Amazon work? Smile. Yeah Amazon Smile. Yes we are. I actually Amazon got an Smile. email today that said uh, it was from Amazon. It was like, just so you know, like the the Jeff's non like, hey, Colin, the nonprofit <laughs> organization that you donate to receives uh, received one hundred five dollars today. Oh. Like because of, I mean, it's, it's used in right. Amazon. They just get like a portion of the proceeds. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. So, so yeah. you're on that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, man. All these little things like that. that little avenues. It, little avenues. Well, I mean, the thing is, like, especially, you know, Facebook's going to be a great uh, way to probably get money mm -hmm. for the nonprofit, right? Whereas mm -hmm. the other platforms might be better in terms of actually letting people know, hey, this is what we do and this is how we can help you. Definitely, I'd say like Facebook is more, yeah, that's kind of like what we use Facebook a little bit more for is like maybe bringing in donations. You know, we still, I still post about as much on Facebook as I do on Instagram just to like let people know what's going on and like if they did donate where their money's going towards. But um, you know, for TikTok, things go viral really quickly on TikTok, so that's why we're on there. And have you been making ballet 
TikToks? <laughs> no, just like for a peace love leotard. So I mean, we have I have, right now I literally I feel like that would do really well. I literally set I mean, up our account like music. a few days ago. Okay. So there's like um, just things like there was one that was like you should follow us, and then there was one that's like here's our behind the scenes process, and then there was one that is like we have our merch, this is our fundraiser, so that kind of thing, and then Instagram is just really where people see kind of what's going on. Do you get engagement from people that like you've donated to that like will send a video or anything of like them in in the dance gear? Yeah, I get email. I get emails from the dancers that we've sent dancewear to, and it, it's it makes me smile so much. Like I love seeing that. Maybe maybe request pictures and you could like post those on the Instagram. It kind of I have. Show. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. definitely. Yeah. Well, I have to ask their permission, of course. But yeah, yeah. that's cool. So I mean, really quick, uh, just because I know how expensive these types of things can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a father with two kids and travel soccer and I'm like, oh man, <laughs> like that's enough <laughs> in terms of expense. I don't think they're spending uh, $200 a, a week on yeah, shoes though. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm like, dude. Like, so I, one of my little bullet point questions that kind of popped up was like, do you have any idea what the average yearly cost is for a dancer in terms of, you know? I think it just mainly everything. depends on the kind of program you're in. Okay. Essentially, because you know, for like, something that you're in, it's going to be like pretty high end. Yeah, is there like an because average? like, I'm not sure that there's. A, I, I mean, if there is an average, it would take a lot of like research, I think, to find out because there are so many dance programs. You know, there's like the competition dancers who do their studio, like and en enroll in competitions, buy costumes for recitals, and their competitions and things like that. There's the ballet dancers who like kind of like who go to a ballet studio and they train and then there's the ballet dancers that are like at a dormitory and that's an added cost so right. i think it just it would take kind it's of a little bit of a research but yeah i'd say i mean i know the average like i said it was like a hundred dollars for just a leotard a pair of tights and um a pair of shoes at least and then there are people that do like I, like I was saying that's what, we, that's what we know is that it costs a lot <laughs> the competition dancers they do different styles too so there's different shoes for that it really just mm -hmm. goes kind of on and on depending on what you're what field you're in yeah so I mean I I kind of wanted to get into a little bit more of the art questions what like because that's me <laughs> yeah yeah he, he likes to no, always do fine. the business stuff and I like you know I, I'm like oh we so got good, yeah. man. um did you always know that ballet was where you wanted to specialize no. What What were your other interests? Well, I really, I grew up, well, the first three classes that I took were um, ballet, tap, and jazz, mm -hmm. and then kind of a little bit of acro, and then we did like lyrical and contemporary, and then musical theater, and then hip hop, and clogging, and oh yeah, you name it, so, I yeah, probably you, you did, it, did right. it. And then when I was, I guess you could say I kind of always knew, it was like, mm, I don't know. When I, was, <laughs> I, love it. I do remember when I was little, I was like, oh, I hate ballet. It's so slow. I just don't want anything to do with it. And then when I was nine, I was like, okay, this isn't so bad. I really want to go to a, like, my mom was like, oh, there's like summer programs where you can like train a little bit at a different studio over the summer. And I was like, oh, that me might be fun. So I went to a, like a week long one when I was nine. And then I kind of kept building as I built on the kind of summer programs and doing more ballet in my studio, then I kind of knew that that's the direction I wanted to do. Did your, did your skill set ever paint you into a specific corner? Like, is there, was there ever a time where like, you know, I mean, obviously you're, you said you're 5'11", right? Mm -hmm. right? Right, like, I don't know if that, I mean, I imagine it has a little bit to do with it, but did you ever feel like your skill set, your size, anything like that, like maybe made, made you a better dancer in one area? Um, did your interest always match what you were good at? Like, like I could see you saying like, you know, if you're like, hey, I was just, I didn't really like ballet, but I got good at it, so that's the path I went, right? And I'm not saying that's the case, I'm just curious. No, I think I was lucky because my interest matched what I was good at. Like I, usually like I did solos growing up and they were either like lyrical, which is like basically like a mix of like ballet and contemporary, but with words, I'd say. Um, and then musical theater, which was just fun thing for me to do. And so when I went on the, I, ooh, I don't know, <laughs> I guess, yeah, because like I'm not that, I wouldn't say I'm not good at like hip hop and tap, but I didn't like them. So therefore I didn't think about them as much. So maybe mm -hmm. I didn't like kind of like 
go for them as hard as I should have. Um, but whereas like jazz ballet and all the other ones, I was like, oh yeah. So I kept like doing those a lot and trying really hard at those. And I mean, it seems logical. So it seems like perfectly like normal. But actually like in terms of like stature, I am probably the tallest ballet dancer you right. can be for a girl because we have to go on point and the guys partner us. So my partner is oh. gonna be like six four. Yeah. And are there a lot of six foot four uh, partners out there for you? Um, In the ballet world? No. No, yeah, I wouldn't no. imagine there were. I'd say, well, right now I partner with someone who's like around six one six two, which is actually really good. Like it could be, I could partner with someone who's six one six two, And I even had a guy who was five nine partner me, which was like, you'd think, how the heck does that work? But he was really good. Like as long as, I think it more curtails to the fact as long as you know what you're doing, then you can pull it off but it does help and have an advantage because there are specific steps where they have to reach over your head and your hand, and I'm gesturing. But um, so with the more height you have, if you have a taller part girl partner, the easier it is. So my partner that I'm partnering with right now is like 6'1", 6'2", so he, that's like good. And then there are there's a few that I know that are like on the taller, like 6'3", 6'4". So then that's even like, easier I'd say for them because it gives them more like mobility to like mm -hmm. partner me. So so speaking strictly as a, an artist, what's what's the dream for you? Like what's the end game? What, where do you want to be? And what, what motivates you to, to reach for that? A dancer with the New York City Ballet. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's the dream. We um, as students get student tickets. Um, they give them out to us. Um, during the year, I'm fortunately they're not performing right now because of COVID. But um, you know, back when it was normal times, um, precedented times, you mm. could say, um, they gave us student tickets, and we would get to go watch the ballet every night. I'd go like two, three times a week to watch them, and that was amazing. And that just like kind of fuels your fire even more to do what to you know reach your goal. What's your what's your favorite ballet? What's the dream ballet that like you you get to be with the New York City Ballet and you get to do this ballet, star in this role? What is it? So either Serenade or Jules. So they're both by George Balanchine, who is the founder of the company. And um, Serenade was a ballet, the first ballet, one of the first ballets that he choreographed in America, and it was on the students of the school, and that's such a beautiful ballet. And then the other one is. Jewels, and that is inspired by different cities. And so um, America is rubies, and so that one's like fast, and there's specifically a tall girl soloist part, and I would love to do that. But then there's also the diamonds, pas de deux, which is like so beautiful. So mm. honestly, like I'd be happy with anything just as long as I got to dance with them. So for any of our listeners that maybe aren't ballet enthusiasts, um, what's something that you could say to them to maybe like drum up some interest for them to go check out like you know, whenever they can again, either either a ballet company like as, as renowned as that one or their local ballet or anything like that? I don't know, I'd just say like even if you weren't interested in it, just go watch. Because there, I know that there are people that like I know, like whether that be friends or someone else that haven't really been interested in ballet, but then once I show them it, there or like maybe if it's a specific ballet, that like that's like the Nutcracker or like which so, is my favorite or like it's cliche, but I, I love it. I, <laughs> no, I, I, see it every year. I understand. And then it's like or a story ballet like Sleeping Beauty or Capella or something that has a story behind it, Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. um, go like watch one of those, and you might find that you really like it. Or ha talk to a dancer because I found that the more people talk to me, the more they actually want to go like watch the ballet. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense. All right, so my question now is about mindset, right? Because it's a good one. yeah, because I feel like you know, look, I'll say this: I'm rooting for you, right? You. I, I know everybody in this room is rooting for you, right? The the odds, and you know this, like the odds seem to be stacked against you, right? I mean, you go from not not like in terms of you personally. I'm talking about like <laughs> I know. Like, it, not, I'm not around. talking. About, I'm not talking about like <laughs> trying to make this not sound terrible. Uh, but like going, you know, you said that two th out of two thousand, two hundred are where you're at, right? At the summer course, or and at the summer course. from the summer course, they probably pick around twenty. I mean, it varies right. every and year. And then you but get to twenty. 
20 and then you know those 20 are kind of fed in sporadically throughout the levels depending on like how old they are and dancing capabilities like what are the odds like of getting on like achieving your dream do you know like roughly what the odds are very very slim okay <laughs> because so that's that's the that's the, the point I was trying to make. <laughs> the most <laughs> I wasn't that trying I to think. insult anybody. Uh, I like I know it's extremely difficult, right? Mm-hmm. So like how do you wrap your mind around that? What are the action like what is your mindset? What are the actions besides like working hard because I know that all the dancers are like working hard, right? So like what what's the mindset? What are your actions to actually make that dream a reality? I think it's just the way you think about it because if you start to think about it as this whole like one big thing and like I don't know if I'll be able to do this like blah 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 you just get kind of like wrapped up in your head like like you said like you can start to make it sound terrible like the odds are stacked against me why am I even doing this um and you know you could tune into like little critiques the teachers give you and that could make your mindset spiral or like compare yourself to other dancers that could make your mindset spiral too and i think just the most important thing is to make sure that you're thinking about the fact that you're doing the best you can every single day and if you look at it like that then it's not so bad do you have spe- specific areas that like when when you when you go to rehearsal or practice or whatever that like you know you're working on this this is what needs to get cleaned up if you're going to get where you want to go I mean over time we have classes and the teachers will give you corrections and over time you can kind of figure out like what your weakness is and so then you can start to work on that and build upon it a little bit more but you know eventually it gets to a certain level where everyone is so talented that it just comes down to what the director wants right so I mean do you it feels, does it ever feel like arbitrary? Like, I, I think I understand what you're saying. It gets to a point where you feel like the, the margin of error is so small and everybody's kind of doing the same thing. It, do you feel like it becomes political or anything like that in terms of the way they pick? Or is it just like, I mean, do you feel, do you feel like, I'm, I'm trying to get there, like, like are, are you at a point where you think that like you have as good of a shot as the next person at, at achieving what your dream is or do you feel like there's something that's like gonna hold you back and I, I just asked this from a stri- strategically like I'm just curious right now I feel like I'm at a good point because I was actually like I'm gonna use sports term I was what they call red shirted mm-hmm. so I'm a senior okay. in high school I'm graduating high school but they asked me and eight other students that includes boys and girls to come back for the next year to train again so they can look at us again. Because right now, I mean, this year, I assume that they're not hiring. Um, But I think ultimately just comes down to timing. So like what's going on like with a company, a company that you're trying to get into. So that could be timing in terms of like what principal dancers are retiring and like who or who's leaving the company or what they need for certain ballots that are coming up. And then just director's personal preference. What's the... I, I feel like we have to like tiptoe. Like I don't want to ask anything the wrong way, but like, what is the the? This is a terrible way of putting it, but like a shelf life for a dancer. Like when when do you get to a point where average career length? Yeah, the career, yeah. Okay, sure. What's the what's the average career length of a ballet dancer? Um, the some of the oldest female dancers are in their forties. Okay. okay, so you've still got. I mean, do you feel like? Uh, let me ask you. Do you feel like but you've got a lot of time in front of you? Or most I feel like retire in their late twenties or in their thirties. Okay. okay. And the reason I ask is because, like, just especially being here in Gainesville at the University of Florida, uh, the whether it's customers or friends or whatever I've come across, a lot of them cheerleaders, gymnasts, dancers, stuff like that, and and especially the ones that have done it for a long time, you know, their bodies break down at ages that it's just mm-hmm. it's just wild. And so, so when I ask those questions, that's that's what I'm thinking of. Oh yeah, right now my I'll be like walking around the house and I'll be like, oh my dad's my dad and I will joke. I'll be like, yeah, I'm like 70. He's like, you you sound like me with my knee. Right. And I'm like, exactly. uh, yeah, because it was funny. I had an injury one time and I was like bursitis in my hip and I was in eighth grade. I was 13 and my gram told me at some point she had like bursitis in her knee or something. I was like, we literally had the same thing and you're 40, 50, like years older than me. <laughs> 50 years older than me, so yeah. So, <laughs> it's just so like, going back to the dysplasia, was that something that was cured or was it just like alleviated or? Um, I mean, I'm sure I still have it. I mean, I haven't really like looked into that okay. too much. It's just kind of something that you're born with and I was like fortunate because I, I don't think that I had too serious of a case if I was able to walk, walk well and then pursue a career in dance. Mm-hmm. 
um, because some people aren't fortunate like that. But um, I mean, because dysplasia makes your hips turn out and ballet is like turned out all the time. Um, it kind of helped a little bit, I guess, <laughs> but I just had to make sure that, you know, things were strong before I continued on the path that I was on because a lot of times in ballet you get injured where in spots, doing things continuously in spots where you're weak. So, yeah. <laughs> As this uh, business continues to grow, mm-hmm. do you, like, how do you see navigating both? Like, do you see somebody else really taking the reins in terms of running it? You know, when you're in, school and, and going through this process of trying to achieve your dream or are you looking at this as something that you'll be able to maintain on your own and then yeah she's yeah. like you shake your head as soon as I said it so it sounds like it's your thing huh yeah I I mean obviously like something that I really want to work on is you know opening up chapters or doing something to where there's like heads of like mini kind of piece of leotards around the world but essentially I feel like I'll always remain the head of it because it's like my my baby I've been doing like I started like the little initiative when I was eight years old so I don't think that I'd ever want to stop that's cool do you have do you have any idea like what the worldwide demand on something like that I mean I'm, I'm sure that's an impossible number to really come up with but like how how far do you have to grow do you feel like to where you can accommodate demand worldwide I'm not sure like how far we'd have to grow, but I think as long as we continue to grow, then we're going in the right direction. And a lot of it is too, like, I mean, there are girls and boys, I'm sure who have wanted to pursue a career in dance, but were told no because of X, Y, like, because of their socioeconomic background. Mm-hmm. So um, like the goal is to just encourage them and be like, you know, you can still pursue your dreams, even if they are expensive because you know, there are things out there like us that can help you. And that's like kind of a big thing that went into, I designed merchandise for our organization to raise funds for it. And the graphic is dreams are greater than cost because you should be able to dream big and go after those dreams without being told no. That's right, yeah. My final question would be uh, kind of around COVID impact. Mm -hmm. Like what's, you know, what's that been like? I mean, it's been a disruption. You started a business right in the middle of COVID-19. <laughs> uh, you know, have you been traveling back and forth between New York City? Has there been a lot of things put on hold? Like, what's that been like? So dance has, that for my dance training, dance has kind of been on hold because um, I actually went up to New York again in October and I was up there for six weeks and I spent four of those weeks in quarantine just because like there was the initial two week quarantine traveling. Then we danced for a week and a half, two weeks. And then we got exposed to COVID because someone in in the studios had had it. And so we were sent back into quarantine. And then while we were in the quarantine the second time, um, the mayor was like, you know, you were shutting down all schools. So then I came back and so I've been home since and you know, we don't know when we're gonna be, go, be going back. Or um, So that aspect has kind of been put on hold which allowed me to kind of dive into this a little bit more. But I think, you know, I'm going to, going to continue to make it a priority even when dan- the dance aspect does ramp back up. I mean, right now I'm taking classes in my foyer and doing like in the entryway of my house. Um, But, you know, so that's kind of like how it's impacted me personally. And then in terms of like the people who need dancewear, at first it was just kind of like a little bit slow. I think in terms of the sponsorship side, because a lot of businesses, it's businesses that donate to us, dancewear businesses. And so they weren't sure like how COVID was gonna impact them financially or what their inventory would look like to be able to donate to us. So I think that's kind of how it impacted the organization because, you know, dancers were still persevering and like taking class in their house. So they were still gonna need the dancewear to do that in. And it's even ramped back up because in some places around the country and the world, dance has started to go back into the studios. So that's definitely even starting to get more rapid, but I think COVID just kind of impacted it from an internal perspective instead of just like, and like affecting it from where the dancers would be like, we don't need dancewear. So. Awesome. So when you get used to being in New York for the last three years and then have to come back to Florida, what was what was that like? Was there any, like, I don't wanna say disappointment, but like, you know, was there an adjustment there that like took a lot of getting used to? 
Um, it was kind of an adjustment, just little things. Um, so, well, initially when they told us that we were going to be going home because of COVID, they just extended our sp- spring break to be five weeks. Right. And then after the five weeks were up, they were like, we're not going back. So it was kind of like an adjustment in little increments. Um, but I think the main thing was just like lifestyle. Uh, you know, I enjoy my time in Florida and I enjoy my time in New York. So there's not really like, eh, like I think the biggest thing that I thought of as a positive was that I would get to spend time with my family because I haven't been able to do that too mm-hmm. much over the past three years. Um, so just like, I think adjusting, you know, being back at home, like living with your parents. And like also the fact that I just got my driver's license like a month and a half ago. So I would be like, mom, dad, can you drive me? Or can I drive you while you sit in the car? Cause I had my permit. So like, as opposed to New York, I'd be like, oh, let's go on the subway and go to Soho. So it's a, that was kind of a little bit of an adjustment. And now, like as opposed to all my friends being like in one place in New York City, you know, a lot of my friends are spra- sporadically spread out, you know, across whether that be across the state of Florida. One of my best friends is two and a half hours away from me in Florida. So even though she's in Florida, she's far away. And then some of them are up in states across the country. <coughs> so just like kind of settling back into that was an adjustment. But I mean, I would say that there are positives and negatives. At least it's warmer. Right, it's warmer. <laughs> that is true, because I walk to school every day and it's freezing in January and yeah. I... I'm such a warm body, man. Like today's weather is beautiful, you know, sunny and 73 degrees. I'm like, man, that's what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah, I'd be on the phone with my mom. Like I'd call her on the way to school and I'd be like, oh my gosh, it's so cold. And she'd be like, oh yeah, it's cold here too. And she'd be like, it's 50. And I'm like, yeah, it's 20. <laughs> yeah. So I win. <laughs> we don't have subways here, so, <laughs> you know. Not yet. The pros and the cons, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, great. Like. Tell us where our audience can, you know, one, donate to your awesome cause, um, connect with you, where can they follow you on social media and and that kind of thing. For all things Peace Love Leotards, our website, you can definitely go check us out. It's www.peaceloveleotards.com. So really basic there. And then the same thing with Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, it's just Peace Love Leotards. And then for my Outstanding Teen account, I'm Miss Gainesville OT. And then um, for my personal page, I'm Alexandra underscore DeRose. So. That's DeRose, just saying. Yeah. I'm telling you. I know. <laughs> Got it now. Thanks. Um, my, I do have one more question. Okay. Uh, so with with your Miss Gainesville, mm-hmm. like, do you have to, like, what are the responsibilities that you have now? Because I know that you said, like, there's some mentoring and stuff involved, yes, right? Definitely. Like, what are some of the, what so are the things I, that you're doing? Like, I was that? a sunshine princess when I started Peace Love Leotards. I now have a sunshine princess and a sunshine prince. So my sunshine princess's name is Taylor. And my sunshine prince is my little brother, Colton. And um, so I just kind of, you know, there's mentoring duties in that res- respect. You know, checking in with them, hanging out with them, doing things with them, doing community service projects with them, doing service within your community, because a big part of the Miss Gainesville's being Miss Gainesville's Outstanding Teen and being involved in the Miss Florida organization is not only what you do with your social impact initiative, mine being Peace Love Leotards, it's what you do to serve your community, so your local community being Gainesville. So you have to put in time to make sure that you're giving back and that's a really big part of the organization is just trying to make a difference and make the world a more better place. Awesome, I love it. Really cool, Yeah. yeah. Well thanks for all your hard work. And best wishes on this pursuit and this dream. I wish you, you the so very much. best. We'll definitely be rooting for you and yeah. keeping tabs, see how Thank you do. You. I'm, I'm excited for you. And uh, you guys, thanks so much to the team that makes the show possible. We got James Leitner who sets up these amazing light. Look how great we look, you guys. <laughs> it's amazing lighting and this camera and the editing. So James, thanks for all your hard work, buddy. And Sarah on, over here doing, throw, throw in the audibles <laughs> mid episode. <laughs> I, mean, I could, not, could not handle that. I could, could not do this without you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Or the cookies, uh, we, we couldn't do it yeah. without the cookies. Oh yeah, the, actually the cookies are prime every week. Yeah. Sarah, you're awesome. And Mike, of course, do you my man? Glad you're back. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and thank you, Colin. Hey, hey. We couldn't do it without you. But before we wrap up, we wanna give love to Kyle Cohen and his team at Leonardo's Millhopper. Leonardo's Millhopper always has incredible specials like Manicotti Monday, Lasagna Tuesday, and Chicken Parm Wednesday. Plus, these specials come with an order of sultry and scrumptious garlic knots and you can get it 
all for $10. Seriously, where else can you get that kind of meal for $10? Not New York City. Not New York City, that's right. (laughs) Give them a call at 352-376-2001 or order online at leonardosmillhopper.com. You can also use 352delivery.com if you would prefer to have it delivered. Easy options to make it easy to fill that belly, y'all. I love you, Kyle. Yeah. You're awesome. Thanks, man. (laughs) <laughs> and you guys, please support all the incredible sponsors that make this show possible. Find them at whoagnv.com slash sponsors or simply click the link in the show notes of today's episode. And uh, when you do, make sure you say, I heard you on the WHOA GNV podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. Hey, whoa. <laughs> we will see you later. Bye. Bye.